welcome to the Rooted in Podcast from Rooted in Language. Our mission is to help all learners, both typical learners and those who struggle, become the best readers and writers they can be. We bring you our best understanding of how to teach students grade K through 12 based on the science of reading. I'm Rita Savasco, a speech language pathologist who's been working with struggling learners for nearly four decades. In today's podcast, I'm honored to be talking with Dr. Jean Houlet, who is a respected researcher in the development of children's spelling skills and in the value of invented spelling. I recently shared his book, Brain Words, with our Rooted community, and I've listened to his podcast called Kindergarten Ready, which I highly recommend to you. Dr. Ouellette is currently the department head and professor of the psychology department at Mount Allison University in New Brunswick. I'm going to let Gene introduce himself to you, our listeners, and tell you a little more about his many credentials. Okay, sure, be happy to. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm now a professor and head of the psychology department at Mount Allison University. Uh, which is located in Sackville, New Brunswick in Canada on the East Coast. It's a small undergraduate only uh, university in a picturesque little town. It, it's quite a special place. Uh, before I got here, my journey actually started uh, like yours. I was a speech language pathologist. Uh, it was my first degree. Uh, and even back then, though, I had this, this great interest in research. And I, I always thought, you know, I'm going to go work clinically for a few years, and then I, I may well go back to school and do my PhD to have a research career. I thought if I work clinically first, it would give me a, a different perspective and inform my research a little more. Uh, but then, like uh, I often say, uh, life got in the way. Before you know it, I have a car payment, and then I met my now wife, and then we ended up with the house and a mortgage and a dog and then a daughter. Uh, and then suddenly it was 12 years later and I realized, you know, I, I still would like to pursue that. So um, at the age of 36, I went back to school. I was a so-called mature student. Uh, and this time I went back to pursue my PhD in educational and developmental psychology uh, in Ottawa, um, Ontario, Canada, the capital of Canada, uh, with a wonderful uh, researcher and mentor there by the name of Manik Seneschal, who uh, had, a, had a long storied uh, research career uh, in areas of early uh, literacy and, and how literacy and language intersect. Uh, and when I finished that degree, I came here to Mount Allison where I've been ever since. Uh, I have a lab here that's called the Language Literacy Learning Lab, where we do studies on uh, topics, including invented spelling, but also on other topics related to how children learn how to read um, and write, and, and in particular of how oral and written language interconnect. Uh, I know you have a lot of information to share. Um, and I really rely on people like you uh, to help me sort through the research because it's complicated, it's confusing. And, you know, I have rudimentary graduate school stats class that helps me a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, and, and so we all are kind of working hard to make sure we're um, not jumping the gun, not throwing out the baby with bathwater, you know, all of those uh, idioms that that really not in a pendulum swing, right? All the things that have been going on in reading and teaching reading and writing over all these years. It took a while for our field to get on board. I finished my master's in 82. And I mean, we really weren't talking about reading and writing at all. No, yeah, and it was just kind of just starting when, when I entered the profession. Um, and, and actually, by the time I left the profession, that's why when I, I originally thought I'd do a PhD in speech pathology, and, and it was by the time, you know, those 12 years of, of practice, clinical practice elapsed, then reading was really a focus of, of the profession. And, and that's really where my interests kind of shifted. And it was like, oh, this connection between speech and language and learning to read and learning to spell, that that's like this, this whole new world to me. And that that's yeah. why I opted to then go back into the psychology, educational psychology stream rather than, than speech at that time. Right, right. It's hard to believe that it wasn't connected, clearly connected mm -hmm. early on when you look back on it now. Well, uh, Gina and I are going to discuss the development of readers and writers and how that impacts us as educators. Many of our listeners are home educators. We also have teachers who listen. So let's get into some details and I'll start with my first question for you, sure. if I can. Okay, I love how your podcast called Kindergarten Ready uh, connected early language development to reading and writing skills. 
And we developed a pinwheels program where we teach reading and writing to new and struggling learners. And one thing we always emphasize when we're teaching is that how important it is to connect new concepts to the knowledge that students already have in their speaking and listening language systems. Uh, so it's really gratifying to read in your research and your book that you talked so much about this connection as well. So um, give us some insights on this connection. We've kind of you know, touched around it a little bit. Um, why do these connections matter uh, of really making sure that that we are helping kids, um, not putting the burden on kids, you know, so much to be the ones who have to juggle all these pieces of their education, but that we as educators help them connect uh, what they're learning with what they already know. Yeah, there's a couple of levels that I, to me, that, that resonate. One is just a very general kind of system-wide connection between oral and written language, right? So written language, reading and, and writing, some of the few higher level cognitive skills we have that don't have a designated area of the brain that that's all it does. Written language really is scaffolded on our oral language, right? So it encompasses all the parts of the brain involved in our oral language. So in, in that way, oral language is, is the foundation and oral language includes knowledge, vocabulary, knowledge of the world, personal experiences, it's tied into memory. So that, that those are all the experiences that written language are built upon. So just in a very general sense, it's hard to separate the two. On a more specific literacy sense, um, we can look at just on a word level. When, when you go to read a word, right, you're, you're linking that, that spelling to a pronunciation and activating the meaning of that word. Well, if you've already got that word in, in your knowledge base, then you've already got the pronunciation, you've already got the, the, the meaning, right? So all you're adding is the spelling. So when you're learning to read, you're just adding one level of representation. You're, you're adding that orthography or spelling, right? And that's a lot easier than if you're adding all three, right? Yeah. If you're not connecting it to, to your existing knowledge and now you're trying to remember this pronunciation and the spelling and the meaning, that's a lot more difficult task than if you've already got the pronunciation and you've already got the meaning in, in your knowledge base. So anytime we can scaffold that, that written language on top of the oral language, it just makes the learning process simpler. Uh, and then you get get uh, better memory traces, right? So when we learn words, it, it helps if we know what they mean. Um, and then if we don't know, if it's a, a new word, then we, we don't want to just learn how to pronounce the word. We want to learn what that word means. And then that connects to other areas of oral language, of course, like sentence structure. You know, when we're, we're saying a sentence, there's certain parts in that sentence that only certain words will fit in. A noun has to go in this part and a verb has to go in that part. And that's our existing knowledge as well. So we have the oral language component and then just our general experiences that we have in life, right? That's how we inform our, our knowledge base and our memories. And we rely upon all that when we encounter printed language. So it, it's, I see it really as kind of a system-wide and as well as the individual word basis that, that the two are interconnected. And, and kids need time, right? They need time to, to be developing this reading and writing. Um, you know, you always hear that phrase and, and we say it all the time about learning to read versus reading to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what does that really mean? You know, I think you're touching on that, that you're learning to read, you're connecting this new skill, read and write. Uh, mm -hmm. I always put reading and writing and spelling all together as, mm -hmm. as what needs to be taught together. You're learning this new skill, right? And, uh, and so your prior knowledge, and, and it's language. That's the other part mm -hmm. of it. It is language. It does connect to what we know. And then later, it gives us information about what we need to learn. But we have to hit a certain skill level. And mm -hmm. because you deal in spelling, um, you know, you really, and I know it's not just spelling, as you say, you do a lot of other work, but you're really hitting in this area that seems to be kind of a, hit, a hitch in our get along, kind of. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, for sure. And, and even just to go back to the whole idea that we learn to read and we read to learn, they overlap more. It's not like one stops, you know, that kind of gave people the idea that you just learn to read and you don't have to connect it with meaning. And then you can read to learn later. You know, as soon as you start developing early reading skills, you can read to learn. You have a, you're reading a picture book, you know, cat in the hat, you'll you'll learn from that book. Yeah, right. Um, and then even once you start to read to learn, you're still developing more advanced reading skills. So they really overlap those. Learn to read, read to learn are, are more overlapping than, than a lot of people might might think. Yeah, good um, point. Yeah. yeah. And then the spelling side, yeah. I mean, spelling is is something that's fallen out of fashion 
you know, kind of comes in and out of fashion, but it's something that that's secondary or people look at, well, maybe I'll have a spelling program, maybe I won't, but it's not the same as learning to read. And really what, what we found over years of study is that they, it, they're the, much the same thing, right? If you can read a word, doesn't mean you can spell it, but if you can spell a word, you can read it. So, I love that quote, by yeah, the way, so, you had that in your book. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's pretty profound if you think about it. So if you yeah. actually teach spelling, you're teaching spelling and reading. Yeah. And, and that's the one kind of the main message that, that Richard Gentry and I have tried to put out in that book and in, in talks that we give is that spelling shouldn't be seen as this tag along thing. I'm going to add some spelling to my program, right? And now with the science of reading focus and people looking at the other ways to teach reading that, oh, maybe better at spelling, that it's not an add on. It's actually part of the whole process. Because if you're teaching spelling, you are teaching reading. Because after the child spells a word, they have it in front of them, they will read the word. And you're developing all the same skills that are used in, in learning to read. So the work we've done have really has focused on this connection that spelling is not just a side thing, because you can also argue you don't need to spell, right? You have autocorrect on your computer. Right. And but isn't that a common kind yeah. of myth going out right yeah. now? Is that you yeah. don't need to spell. Talk about that a little bit, because yeah. why is that a myth? Yeah, and especially in the school system, if you know people are busy and it's like if I can. I don't have time to do everything, so I don't have to do this because in, in the modern world, who needs spelling, right? And, and I can tell you, I teach at a university and, and I can tell you many university students have terrible spelling. But what, what we know is that, that spelling reflects the detail that you're storing about a word, right? So even though you can be a good reader without being a good speller, if you're a good speller, you're an even better reader. You can be a faster reader. You, you can uh, generalize across different words in, in learning new words uh, better. Um, so being a better speller helps you become a better reader, even when you're as an adult, if you improve and work on your spelling, your reading can become faster and more fluent. Yes. And writing. I mean, writing. I struggled with spelling. My uh, struggles were always in that visual word form memory for anything mm -hmm. that had a schwa, right? So was right. it T-I-O-N or S-I-O-N, you know, or, you know, anything that had a schwa or that had same spelling options. And I would avoid writing words right. unless I could check my spelling. Right. It definitely impacted writing. It slowed yeah. me down. You know. yeah, and then if it slows you down, then you, you stop to think of that spelling, you might lose your, your train of thought of if it's a longer composition or more elaborate writing. Um, it can deviate from the thought process of what the content is, because now you're allocating those resources to thinking about this word spelling. Whereas if that was a more fluent spelling for you, then you devote your attentional resources to what the actual composition is. Right. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of different levels, the word level and the compositional level spelling is, is really important. And, you know, less people think that this idea that we don't need spelling is, you know, well, that's foolish. Who thinks that way? Um, I think about 10 years ago, I did a short term sub covering for someone in one of our local school systems, high school, and everyone was up in arms. It was the beginning of the school year and everyone was up in arms because the superintendent of that school system had said that they didn't need to teach spelling that year that, you know, kids didn't need it. They had other resources and they weren't, you know, other outside resources for their spelling and they weren't going to use time resources on spelling anymore. Mm -hmm. Half the teachers were relieved, half of them were up in arms. And I was like pulling my hair out. Are you kidding me? But I was kind of an outsider. And that's what we've tried to, I mean, we tried to sell the idea because some of those people you can't convince because it is time, you know, how much time do you have? And maybe, you know, you could say in life, you can get by without spelling because of all the assisted technology we have, right? So we really try to stress that it's not just, like you say, the, the spelling, it's the compositional writing, and it's also reading, right? And people are super concerned about reading. So if we can highlight the spelling reading connection, I think it really stresses to people. It's not a separate thing. It's part of a literacy curriculum, right? and it helps kids learn how to read, and it helps kids become better readers if they can spell. Right. It's part of the practice, right? Yeah. You don't do just one kind of soccer drill. You do a lot of different kinds yeah. of soccer drill to become a good soccer player or whatever. You know, it's part of the, the scope yeah. of the practice. And that that's an important piece to know. It's not some book that you buy out there that you allocate 20 minutes a week to mm -hmm. or whatever, and then have a test, right? It's a part right. of the whole process. Of yeah, absolutely. Um, so that takes us to your book about brain words. So tell 
you know, some people have read your book with me, but there will be some listeners here who haven't. So tell us a bit about BrainWords. What made you decide after all these years of this information to put it out there? Sure. Yeah. You know, um, my work on invented spelling started in the early 2000s. And prior to that, the original kind of focus on invented spelling came from the early 1970s. Uh, Carol Chomsky was an educational writer who wrote a paper in 1970 advocating the use of invented spelling to teach young children how to read. Um, Charles Reed was a linguist who, who wrote extensively describing children's invented spellings. Uh, and that was like 1975-ish. Um, and then Richard Gentry began writing about invented spelling in, in the late 1970s as well. And so here I was in the early 2000s revisiting this topic because it kind of had fallen out of favor. Yeah. And then when we start to look into it, we were amazed at just how much theoretical support there was for a role of invented spelling. Um, and so I started a line of research with Monique Senechelle at, at Carleton University. Um, and we published several studies in which we, we worked with kids in kindergarten um, and had them just invented spell words like we never showed them the word to copy we just asked them to spell words and they could spell them anyway and then we would talk about the spelling and we'd shape it and to kind of discuss how their spelling differed from the conventional spelling and kind of shaped it into the conventional spelling over time and just gave them practice in these really fun activities writing words never to memorize something that they saw it was always to hear the word and just to invent their own spelling and we talk about it can i interrupt there for a second sure. um so when you did this work with the children, you said they were in kindergarten. These were kindergarten kids, yeah. Um, so did they have alphabetic knowledge? Did they have a sense of the sound to letter connections? Yeah, they were just beginning. Uh, and we also did a little bit of alphabet teaching to help them along the way. So we, we do right. like alphabet songs and sound letter matching games uh, in addition to the spelling. Um, and then what we found over and over again, we did the study several times with different groups of kindergarten kids with different characteristics. They became better readers. Um, and then we did other research that was more correlational. We, we tested kids on their invented spelling in kindergarten and then followed them up in grade one and grade two and grade three. And their invented spelling in kindergarten predicted how well they would read later on. So, so we had these several studies kind of all showing direct evidence that this is really important, learning how to read. And I got an email one day from Richard Gentry, who had saw these papers. I didn't know Richard. I said his, you know, I'm sorry, Richard, if you're listening. He is a little bit older than me. His work was in the <laughs> 70s. Uh, and he just reached out and we started communicating via email because I had kind of brought back his work from the past and he was fascinated by what we were doing. And we kind of connected online. My wife actually joked a couple of times that I had developed this online relationship with this unknown stranger. Uh, but we had this, this, this connection because we shared this interest in spelling, but also this, this disconnect between research and practice. And Richard left academia early in life to become more of an advocate for well, long before the science of reading was any, a thing, uh, you know, Richard was advocating for this, this research-based approach to teaching reading and spelling. And I, I say as a researcher, I, I give presentations all the time to other researchers and educators go to conferences and they hear from other educators and there's very little crosstalk. And, mm -hmm. and Richard and I were, were just discussing this again online. We had never met. And, and we came up with this idea, why don't we try to write a book, not for researchers, but we want to take the research and the science and try to make it presentable in a readable fashion, but we didn't want to dummy it down. We said, let's take, you know, the technical complicated research and try to present it in a way that would appeal to teachers and, and parents um, if they're really interested in literacy. Uh, so we took the idea to a publisher. We, we picked Stenhouse as a publisher out of New Hampshire, um, specifically because they, they target direct to teacher, direct to individual sales. Their products are priced a fraction of academic books. Like, I don't think they sell a book over $30. Mm -hmm. um, and they were interested in it, that they had some restrictions. They wanted it to be what they call a thin book. That's why the book is so short. It had a really strict word limit. Uh, they were very picky about not using too much terminology to try to really make it readable. And so we kind of pitched this idea, got an agreement with the publisher to write the book. And Richard, and I still had never met. So um, I ended up going down. Richard is in Mobile, Alabama. Oh, wow. Uh, so That's I went down. We, for you. <laughs> yeah. So we, I went down there. We spent some time together and we connected, not just professionally, personally. Um, wonderful, not just fascinating in terms of his experience and knowledge, really a wonderful human being and, and happy to call him my friend now. We really connected on, on many levels. Um, and we wrote the book together. And really with this shared goal of trying to bridge the gap between research and practice. Right? And this is, again, was this process started before science of reading became a really popular phrase and people were paying attention. 
Um, and, and the book kind of sat there for a few years, it came out in 2019. And it really was a year or two before anyone kind of started to pay attention to it with the, the focus on the science of reading and, and, and it's gained a little bit of a readership since then. And, and hopefully people will be able to appreciate at least the intent behind the book was to, was to give the science and the research, but bridge it with practice, make it accessible, but not, not like I say, not dumbing it down really. I mean, it's, it's, there's a couple dense chapters in there, especially at the beginning. It's kind of like the theories, the front end and the applied mm -hmm. at the back end. Chapter two is my my chapter on theory, and I know that can be a, a bit of a tough read, and I tried to make it as readable as possible and divide it into sections and, and really to give people a, a knowledge base so that when, when others make claims about teaching kids, it, how are we to evaluate claims about how kids learn how to read if we don't have an understanding of the underlying processes and research? And, uh, you know, this isn't just false praise here. I think you really hit the mark there. Well, thank you, you. I felt like I was sharing a book that was uh, very readable, but informative at the same time. Um, you did a great job. You gave people resources at the end if you wanted to go and, and read more on your own. You know, you you did a, a nice overview of the research. I mean, it's part of the reason why I started listening to you more and wanting to talk to you because I personally struggle with that and I'm not a researcher. But on one hand, I feel like, well, I have to give all this information so that people know I'm just not another person out here with a philosophy, right? I mean, there's lots of philosophies. Is there anything behind the philosophy? But at the same time, if you use a lot of jargon, you know, it just slows you down. It's like you said, you, the more we know a word, the faster we access meaning, right? And I, I don't think I've actually always hit a good balance of that. I think I'm starting to give more and more information because it needs to be there, you know? And I, so I do feel that it, for those of you who haven't read Brain Words, it's, it, you want to read it for a lot of reasons. And, and one of the big ones is it's just such a nice overview of what's been going on. And what kind of are the more trusted ideas that have been replicated enough? And well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And Richard's actually much better at it than, than I am. He's, he's had much more practice in, in writing for more general audiences. Mm -hmm. You know, academic writing can be dry, even when we get past the terminology. And my wife used to say it was a good, good for people who had trouble sleeping. But, but so we really did try to make it a little more readable. And Richard's really helped me with that process. He's quite yeah. skilled at it. Well, and, you know, I think you also hit upon this gap between the research and practice. And I, this is another thing that keeps me up at night, quite honestly, because, you know, I'm sharing ideas with parents and there are things I've learned and things I've tweaked and things you know, I've worked with students and then I see the research and I'm trying to apply. And the truth is exactly the way I do it has not undergone, you know, a big study, right? It's big, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of important theories. And, but who's to say you teach this letter before that letter? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I mean, yes, there's a lot about how we teach that including your invented spelling ideas. But if I start with a B and you start with an M, you know, I pick my five consonants and a vowel or whatever, and you pick your five and a vowel. We don't know yet yeah. which one's the right way. How long do we spend on that? We know that we need to work to the child's level of understanding and success and then move, keep moving that and them down the path. But there's a lot of gaps there. And I, I appreciated that the book was trying to come up with something very doable. Yeah, we, we kept the focus specifically on the spelling reading connection for that reason. Yeah, there, there are a lot of gaps, you know, and that's the important thing to recognize with science is it evolves and, and, and a lot of programs, like you say, we, we have a lot of accumulated a lot of knowledge over the last decade or two about processes going on when children learn how to read and write. The, the neurological processes, what's happening between oral and written language. Right. And so now we develop approaches based upon that knowledge. But like you say, the actual approaches, they're based upon theory that's supported by research. But the approach itself will have details that, that we're using our best judgment. But we don't know for sure. Absolutely. Right. And we don't know if it's going to uh, affect all kids in the same way. Right. So it, it's the best tools we have. And then we have to be aware that, you know, we, we still want to continue to grow our knowledge. Right, absolutely. And and be flexible enough, open enough to yep. say, 
this could be new. I can remember the first time I was really reading Berninger's work about um, alphabet, saying the alphabet and saying letter names while writing. And I mean, I'm a speech language therapist. I'm like all about saying sounds, you know, it's like, let's get to the content. Let's get to the meaning. Let's get to the value. I was an invent. I, I learned about invented spelling in the nineties, you know, which is way behind you, but, <laughs> and I remember when it fell out of favor and I show, I'm seeing classrooms with my own children were being exposed to word walls and guests. Yeah. And use the word wall to put a sentence together mm -hmm. um, and make sure you write it from the word wall. Can you talk a little bit about why invented spelling did go out of vogue and kind of address that? Because I think people worry about it a little bit still. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because, you know, in the whole history of reading instruction, I mean, people talk about the reading wars, which... You know, personally, I think it's a fairly distasteful term, but I mean, just this idea that there was different factions of, of how should we teach reading, and people thought it had to be really a drill-based, skill-focused approach. Um, other people, right, then the pendulum so-called shifted to more whole language and immersion style, and really, mental spelling didn't fit in anywhere, because the more focused on, on individual skills saw it as this kind of loosey-goosey, unstructured thing. There's always been this fear that if a child invented spelling, isn't going to be right. They're going to learn that wrong spelling and they'll never learn how to spell, right? And we know from direct research, that's not true at all. It actually helps them learn the correct spelling. Um, but yet that, that, that fear, fear persisted. And then when things became more contextual, more, more embedded in, in literature, it seemed to be more of a, a print to speech connection. So it was all about the teacher organizing the classroom to be rich in print. And it was all more the reading than the writing. And then when writing became more in vogue, there were programs, it was all about quantity of output. The kids had to write and they were judged by how many words they could write. So, and, and again, it wasn't the focus on the spelling. So it kind of never fit in anywhere. And there was like, they say, a brief period of time where kind of cut on there. It was kind of like in between phonics and all language. But again, I think it's just that fear that people have that they're not spelling right. And we're going to have a whole, whole generation of kids who are going to be doing invented spelling in their 20s or something, right? And, and, and I think that really blocked people from looking more, more, more objectively into what the process is. And then there was, the, I think, also the misinterpretation that people were saying invented spelling means we don't teach correct spelling. And that, that was never said by the early proponents. It was that invented spelling shows you where the child's at, and it shows you the difference between where they're at and the conventional spelling. Then you can guide your teaching to get them there. So it was, it was never supposed to be a replacement. It was supposed to be a tool. And that's something that Richard and I really talk about. And now, with, again, with this focus on the science of reading, I think people are starting to, to realize, okay, what does the research say? Um, and the research, is it, it's not an area where there's conflicting studies. It's like the same, Monique and I have done the same study over and over again with different groups of kids with different characteristics. And the results are always the same. That if you have kids, you encourage them to, to, to invent spelling. And again, it's, it's really important that it's not visual. It's not a memorization. It's not, here's your list, study the list, and we'll spell it. They're only hearing the words. You have them write the words, and they're told up front, there's no right or wrong. I just want to see what you do. Um, and then you take what they give you and talk about it. Oh, I see you've got this letter. That's, that's the same as me, but this is different. This is why. You know, this sound, this word dog, dog, has three sounds. I have three letters. How many letters do you have? Like, just have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. That helps them learn the conventional spelling. And then we always end up with the proper spelling, and that's what they read, right? So then you can recopy what they, they spelled in the proper conventional form and have the child read that word. So you're connecting spelling, you're connecting um, spelling and reading and meaning. It's all inter integrated. And again, we've, we've studied this over and over again. And if you have children do that, they become better readers. The objective data is there, and I think now with the focus on science of reading, people are starting to pay attention to that. And there's still skeptics because, and they also think the word invented doesn't help because people think, oh, why are we letting kids invent spelling? And so sometimes we try to say developmental spelling and that to avoid that, or child-directed spelling is, is a good term, I think. Just this idea that don't ask kids to memorize something and, and spit it back, just see what they come up with. And it tells you so much about where they're at. I'm uh, chuckling to myself because you said the fear was that we'd end up with a bunch of 20-somethings who can't spell. And when mm -hmm. you started 
this conversation, you said I'm at the university and I see a lot of yeah, exactly. We, we've done that. We can't spell. <laughs> we've done that because we haven't incorporated spelling. Yeah, exactly. I, I did remember what I was going to comment on was that as we're learning, we also have to be flexible. That uh, some of Berninger's work about Virginia Berninger's work about needing to say letter names and and know your letter names threw me off early in my earlier. Well, you know, uh, not earlier, not much earlier, actually, about 10 years ago. And I was thinking, do I think this is true? Well, I'm going to watch it for a while. And I watched it for a while. And then I started working more with kids. And then I started thinking about when it why it could be also true. But I just always went right for sound. But I was skipping teaching letter names and making sure kids knew that too. Turns out that's an important literacy skill, you know, Mm -hmm. And so we do have to be flexible as we're learning and putting together what we do, but we can't just jump on every, hey, I read a study that said this one study in the New York Mm -hmm. Times. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, Yes. And then you also made another comment about how writing was so much about number of words. Also, I feel like in writing, we jumped pretty quickly to composition. Mm -hmm. And and then we still had kids who were struggling with handwriting and spelling. Mm -hmm. When we work with parent educators in particular, they are looking for programs, you know, that are like the reading program, the spelling program, the writing program. And, you know, that's the way most of us were taught. You had your reading time, your writing time, your spelling time. And this idea that we really fold all of this together is is difficult for educators. First of all, they have to get a big, you know, it's hard to have a path that way. And then the other thing is that it's a lot of hard work. And what I like to say is, well, somebody's going to do the juggling. It's either you or the child, right? Like somebody's got to put it all together. And hopefully it's both of us, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Me and the child. But there is still a lot out there about waiting for readiness, waiting for spelling. And I think you've already addressed that, but waiting for reading readiness. And you talk a lot in kindergarten ready about this child development, this kind of readiness that comes along. And what is readiness? Readiness, I think sometimes people think it means my child wants to, comes to me one day and says, I want to read now. You know, I, I'd never exercise if I waited for want to, right? You know, that kind of thing. So we know our kids need to become readers and writers. So waiting for want to may not happen. Um, what is readiness and what does it look like in terms of reading, writing, spelling? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that's a biggie. And yeah, in, in the podcast, we called it kindergarten ready because I, in one of my clinical work and even now um, in academic work, I get asked a lot, like, how do I know if my child is ready? And, and, one of the points of the podcast was to try to, to, to put forth the idea that it is more of a global developmental thing in that it's readiness is, is having an oral language basis, having speech and language stimulation, ideally, um, to have a rich oral vocabulary, to have experiences in the world that develop knowledge. So the, the oral language foundation is there to, to become ready to learn literacy. Uh, and then general readiness, uh, there's other skills, right? Self-regulation is a big issue uh, in, in the school system in, in particular. Like you have to develop self-regulation. You have to develop the ability to control emotions, to, to focus attention. Um, so there's a lot of cognitive skills as well, but they're not taught in, in a sit down, learn this skill fashion. They're, they're part of the developmental process um, and come from life experience. Right. So to, to me, readiness is a, a really a global concept from the oral language foundation um, combined with some cognitive attentional skills of, of self-regulation and to be able to, to regulate your attention. Uh, you know, if, if you cannot focus your attention for more than a second or two, you're going to have difficulty, you know, learning in a formal educational setting. So I think that's kind of the, the, the premise between uh, behind this idea of overall readiness, but it's not like a set checklist, right? It's not like, oh, hey, here's a set of skills. Um, let's, let's make a, a preschool, you know, academy to teach these 20 skills and then you'll be ready. I, it's not something that objectively concrete in my view. I think it's much more global developmental concept. And I especially hear talk about whether kids are ready to be holding pencils or ready to be mm-hmm. holding crayons or ready to be, are their motor skills up, up 
to par, you know, and I, I always like the, you know, the way you learn to ride is by riding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the way you learn to ride a bike is by riding a bike, right? So what do you think about the whole riding young kids with pencils, crayons? Marking? Yeah, I mean, that gets to the more objective sort of checklist approach. And, and there is some validity to some aspects. I mean, you can have some five motor problems and, and occupational therapists can, can work with children if, if they have really pronounced difficulty in that way. Um, but generally, readiness is, again, developed just through experience. So you're going to magically wait to a child can hold a pencil before you give them a pencil. Um, there's really no age limit for a child to pick up a writing utensil, a marker, or a crayon, right? And it doesn't matter how they hold it at first. Uh, we look at sort of the early writings. Before children even learn the alphabet, if you give them a big marker or crayon, they'll make, they know that there's graphic forms represent language somehow. They'll make scribbles or big draw a picture or a big line because they think that's writing, right? And that, that's one of the early stages or phases rather of, of, of developing spelling is just putting something on paper. And then in terms of formal readiness and fine motor skills, you develop that through practice. Yeah. So, so what better way than just have a variety of writing utensils available? I mean, I have four grandchildren, two of them are two. And I watch them with their crayons. Uh, one of them has been working on circles since summer. Well, you know, four months later, three months later, those circles are looking a little more like circles. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and then the other one, his marks are getting darker. He's getting like more control over yeah. that. Yeah, it's his practice. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. It, it's, and it's all so acceptable. Somehow, though, we cross this magic line of, yeah. uh-oh, now it's a letter. Well, yeah. don't do that, right? Okay, so I, I do want to wrap up, but I sure. I wanted to let you know that um, I was particularly interested in the episode you did in Kindergarten Ready called Shared Reading in Storybooks. And it's one that I really want to encourage everyone to go and listen to. First of all, I think the whole podcast, even if you have children well beyond kindergarten age, is is the whole series is interesting because you really dig into um, what's really going on in our little brains, you know, <laughs> when when we're at that stage and what does that mean for reading and writing down the road. So I think that the entire series is is really good, even if uh, the age level is doesn't fit your kids. Um, but this one, shared reading in storybooks, you taught you did just a beautiful job of explaining how research can both lead us and mislead us. And you did a really nice job talking about, you know, how a study set up can really inform how you can use that information. It's one of the reasons why you need a lot of people. I mean, I, I I'm sure you've set up studies that as soon as it's over, you know all its flaws, right? And and in fact, you're supposed to report those in your research. Where were the where were the flaws? What needs to happen next? But you did a really good job of explaining that difficulty in looking at research. And with all that's going on right now, you know, I'm like you, I'm starting to almost dislike the term. I'm almost starting to dislike the term science of reading, sadly. And I <laughs> I use it because I don't know what else to say, but it's just all of a sudden, you know, you get lines drawn in the sand and it's, it gets a little tricky. But what advice do you have for others as they're trying to sort through this information? Yeah, it, it's difficult. Um, I mean, I the science of reading, I will be stand up for the term just as an advocate, as a researcher. You know, I, I think people see it as another trend and, and worried about the pendulum, but I always just argue with people to think about what the term means. Science, by definition, is the objective study of something. So all the science of reading really is, is saying we should have an objective evaluation of the evidence. And that's it. Now, it's been kind of hijacked by some to promote one program over another, right. but you know, it's, it doesn't mean phonics. It doesn't mean only phonics or only drilling you know, out of context or what have you. All it means is to objectively evaluate the evidence. And so if you think of it in that terms, then then I think it it, it is um, a justifiable and admirable phrase, because if that can direct educators away from some of the other things they've been sold over the years by by very large publishing companies, um, 
then then that that's progress, I think. But there also has to be with the caveat that as we talked about earlier, science doesn't have all the answers. It's the best path we have, but we have to be flexible and we have to acknowledge that this is what the data and the research suggests, but it's not written in stone. And, and to disseminate as a researcher, it's difficult to get the information into the hands of general public. And so you, what you'll get is something in the mainstream media in a newspaper or an online source that may or may not be accurate, right? And, and so we have to be really careful uh, on that. So, I mean, we look towards, um, you know, sources we can trust. There are some online resources out there, look for validation across multiple sources. Um, and then really, I think the really, the most important thing about research is to realize that the research is based upon groups, right? So we take a group of children and we study this and we're talking about averages and trends, but that doesn't mean it explains everybody in that sample. You know, even in my own work, I say, well, we've got study after study showing that invented spelling really helps children learn how to read. The research that we show shown over and over again that having kids practice invented spelling helps them learn how to read, that's based upon group data, right? So we got 50 children and their average score increased from, from X to Y. That doesn't mean every kid in there had the same improvement. Right? Some kids improve more than others. Some probably didn't. Right? So just because the science and the research suggests one path, it doesn't mean it, it's a panacea. It's not going to help every single child. Right? So we, we still have to be aware of, of individual variability and individual differences in children. Science of reading gives us the best path, the best path but it's not a guarantee. So we start there. But like you said earlier, we have to be flexible and we have to be, recognize individual strengths and, and weaknesses of, of the individual children and, and be able to tailor and adapt and modify as we go. So I think science of reading is a good starting point, And then we have to take that and then incorporate it into the knowledge of, of the child, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. It does. It does make sense. And and um, yeah, when I said I, I was starting to not like the term, it's not because I don't believe it's important. I just want to clarify. I do think it's important. It's just it can create its own narrow paths that then yeah. become close minded about whatever the next piece of information is. And, and I don't know, you know, sometimes yeah. sometimes the things that are being argued about, you know, should phonological processing include letters or not letters? And is it real phonological awareness work if letters are there? And it's just like, um, a, yes. And B, why are we talking? About, you know, yeah. I don't know. Sometimes yeah, no, no, that's a good point. I saw I, I don't use Twitter very often. Um, but I, I saw something on there very recently, and it was somebody arguing based on the meta analysis done on phonological awareness that it made no sense to ever do it without letters because the meta analysis showed that you had better impact with letters. Right. But it goes back to this whole idea that that doesn't explain every individual child. Right. And there might be a child in there who has trouble with phonological awareness with letters. And then you don't know if it's because of their auditory skills or their letter knowledge. So it makes sense to go back and do it without letters. Right. And, and I commented, which I rarely do, and which I probably shouldn't should know better. And then right away, the person answered, well, well, that doesn't make sense because the study showed this. I said, well, that's not really what the study showed. You're not digesting the entire study. The study showed that on average, that was the way that the best result but that doesn't mean it's for all children right and those auditory skills are important as well so and developmentally it makes sense to do the auditory skills before the children even may know the alphabet why you know you don't have to wait i mean that's what we're doing when we're doing rhyme play and yeah exactly songs and all that yeah, yeah. kids don't have alphabets yet yeah right <laughs> that it just was a nice segue into one problem that i know um people were thinking after reading brain words is um, a lot of us have clients, um, possibly our own children, students, who we've done the hard work, we've done lots of phonological training, we've done the phonological awareness with and without letters, we've done, you know, lots of writing and, and work and using your methodology on some spelling one way or another, even if it's not exact, but that, you know, kids are writing with invented spelling, they seem to have real trouble developing this word for memory for words. And, um, you know, those are the kids that are going to be a little bit of the outliers and we know mm -hmm. they're there. And then that comes back to this individual variability uh, that, I, that I was talking about. And, and those are the cases where, again, science of reading gives us the best path, right? So say sometimes when kids get older, we, we, we kind of forget about the precursor skills. So, I mean, first off, I, I, I'd say to make sure that 
like you say, the phonological awareness and the alphabet knowledge is there, um, no matter how old they are, just to make sure that foundation is there. Um, and then if that's the case, what, what the invented spelling approach gives you is a way to look at individual word formation then, because they say that the difficulty is going from the decoding, which is effortful and, and, and you get phonetic spellings, to go from that to word specific knowledge, to know that this is the right way to spell this word. And then when I see that word, I can read it rapidly and it's not a long effortful process. Um, and in, in our experience, and again, based upon theory and, and knowledge that's research supported, is that if you have children write, it can be contextual, you know, if they're older, you know, write me something about what you did yesterday or your friend's birthday or what have you. And then look at the words that are misspelled and see if you can find some patterns. Oh, you know what? It's vowels followed by an R are never correct in this spelling. Or are they only multisyllabic longer words? Or are they words with, with blends or certain vowel combinations? And when you look at it that way, then you can actually target individual teaching about those types of words. As we talked about earlier, I think we started off the whole conversation about the importance of context and meaning, um, which is great for reading accuracy. But when it comes to word specific problems, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking those words out and studying them in isolation. So I had the child write this passage and I see these words that are misspelled. Now I'm going to take those words and have them practice spelling those words. And again, we can talk about it rather than just show them the right spelling and say, this is what you did. This is the right one. Memorize it. We'll talk about it. This is the part that, that we're missing some letters, or this is a weird word. It doesn't really sound like this, but it needs these letters here. You, know, you don't hear a G, but there's a G in there kind of thing. Right. Right. And then we, we, we make, start making lists of words and have the, the children practice spelling and reading those words. And, and then what we often find is that there are particular patterns that they're having the most difficult with, like you say, getting to the word form area in the brain and storing them as, as intact units. Um, and one of the best ways to see that is just to look at writing samples and then pull out the children's mistakes from that writing sample and practice them in isolation. Yes. And just because we've taught something doesn't mean kids have retained it or using it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. a lot of these kids really need to keep revisiting a mm -hmm. lot of this information. And the way to guide us is to look at their errors, right? Yeah. And it might be word chunks, like you mentioned earlier, that the T-I-O-N, the shun, right? Yeah. That's a really difficult one. Right. So then maybe we'll come up with a whole bunch of words with that same ending. Right. So you do like a word study based upon the child's own errors in their in their written samples. Thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. For those of you who haven't read Brain Words by Dr. Richard Gentry and uh, Dr. Jean Lett, uh, be sure to read that and also be sure to listen to Kindergarten Ready, add it to your podcast list. And uh, I don't know how many episodes you have on there. Yeah, there's not that many. Maybe 12 or 15 or something. Kind of ran out of steam and time. Maybe it might make a comeback later this year. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you do a great job of explaining information and making it very accessible to people. I just want to say, so I'm cheering you on. That you well, thanks. I appreciate it. Come that. back to it again sometime. <laughs> thanks so much. This is Rita Sabasco from Rooted in Language. As always, we appreciate your listening and your support. When you like our podcast or blog, and when you share them with your friends, you help others find this critical information. Follow us on social media, both Facebook and Instagram. Visit and share our website, rootedinlanguage.com. And support our mission to help all learners become the best readers and writers they can be, including your own kids.